بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله tonight we continue our Quranic studies uh, classes إن شاء الله it's gonna be on Monday and Wednesday uh, on Monday we will uh, do تجويد okay and then on Wednesday إن شاء الله we will do تفسير and in each session, such such inshallah, we're gonna finish with the tilawa. So we do the lecture, and then after the lecture, inshallah, we will do the tilawa bi idhnillah. So the tajweed, inshallah, as I said in the pre uh, last week, that we are doing kitabul burhan fi tajweed al Quran. Al Muallif al Sheikh Muhammad al Sadiq Amhawi. That's a very good book, uh, a very basic book that gives you the foundation of ilm uh, tajweed. And at the same time, it has very, very good information that you need throughout your recitation with the Quran. And it's very important to learn the tajweed along with your recitation uh, for the Quran. Inshallah, we're going to study the importance of ilm tajweed because unfortunately, in a lot of countries, uh, we have qurra that read the Quran, but they have no tajweed. They read the Quran quickly. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Maliki, Yawmiddin. That's not how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read it and this is now the Sahaba Rabbanullahi alayhim read the Quran. You have to read it with the Tajweed. Ilm al-Tajweed, Ikhwat al-Iman, it goes into two categories. Uh, Insha'Allah, today we're just going to go uh, over some terms and some things that are around Ilm al-Tajweed. We're not going to study the book today because we want to understand Ilm al-Tajweed in some uh, terms that always you hear the Mashayikh or the Qurra that are teaching the Quran saying. So we have to understand these terms, what do they mean? Uh, like Al-Ijaza, what is Al-Ijaza? Al-Qira'at, right? You go to some masajid, the Imam is not reading in Riwayat to Hafs. He's reading in a different form. So what is that? Did, did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi read according to that Qira'ah? Is it better to learn Hafs? Or what uh, recitation, what riwayah should we be uh, learning? So inshallah, I'm gonna cover that tonight in the next week. We will, inshallah, start reading and, and, uh, and learning the book. The book, unfortunately, is not English. It's not translated to English. So I'm going to be reading Arabic and then trying my best to translate it and explain what the mu'allif, what the author uh, means, uh, uh, what the author, inshallah, is explaining in his book, بإذن الله. علم التجويد, when you say علم التجويد, إخوات الإيمان, it goes into two categories. Okay, we have that theoretical way of learning Ilm al-Tajweed, what does that mean? That you uh, have a lecture, just like what we are doing. We learn what is Al-Ghunna, how many harakat we should do the Ghunna, how many tabs of Al-Mad we have, Makharij al huruf the letter, what it comes from, okay? And then we have the second part, or the second tab of Al-Tajweed, which is Al-Tajweed al-Tatbiqi, the applied or the practical Tajweed, meaning that you apply whatever you have learned in the theoretical Tajweed. So the Ghunna, how do you say the Ghunna? So that the practical tajweed. And in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was there any theoretical tajweed? Was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching the Sahaba ghunna, mad, makharij al-huruf, sifat al-huruf? No. He was just teaching them the practical tajweed. They just sit in front of him, they read the Quran, and he correct them when they make mistakes. So that's the practical tajweed. And you can learn the tajweed without even reading any tajweed book. Just from your shaykh. And that what happens with kids when they learn from a good teacher. So it could, could be four or five or six years old, and he has a good teacher, and the teacher is teaching the kid with tajweed. So the kid, naturally, and um, because he was taught correctly, so his recitation is already in place with that tajweed. But unfortunately, in a lot of schools, uh, teachers don't pay attention to the tajweed. So people memorize the Quran without the tajweed, and then later on, they have to learn the tajweed, or they have to know what is a tajweed, or to pronounce the letters correctly and properly. So inshallah, we're gonna cover both. We're gonna do the, we're gonna do the theoretical um, tajweed. We learn the tajweed, and then inshallah, after that, we're gonna have another session of recitation. We read. You read, and I listen to your recitation. If there's any mistake, inshallah, I will correct your um, mistakes. And how Ilm al-Tajweed started? In the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not Ilm al-Tajweed. I'm talking about the theoretical one. They were just learning it through reading the Quran. So they sit in front of the Prophet. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. But how are you supposed to read the Quran? 
So how many harakat the mud is? They don't know in terms of uh, harakat, but they know how to say it. Okay? But after that, the scholars of Islam, they followed the sounds of the tajweed. Okay? They listened to the Quran. Okay, harq al ha, where it comes from? It's from the hal. Where? The bottom, the top, the middle is from the middle. So, makhraj al ha is the middle of the throat. They know it. Okay? Okay, kha, where it comes from? It comes from the bottom or the top of the throat. They put it in a book. And this way, they categorize all of the letters and explain what, uh, where each letter it comes from. And then sifatul huruf, then the attributes of the letters. So when we say sheen, sheen, what is the difference between sheen and jeem? They all come from the same source. Jim has certain attributes, she has certain attributes, and inshallah we're gonna learn that. Sifatul Hurub. So they write it down. Okay, and then the mudud. We have Maddul Lazim, this is six, six harakat. We have a Maddul Muttasil, it's five harakat. We have a Maddul Muttasil, Al Mufasil, five harakat. So they put all of that down, and then they started teaching this knowledge. So you learn it in a book, and then also you practice that by saying what was written in the book, and learning that from your Shaykh. So the theoretical tajweed, sometimes you can even learn it yourself. You can have, if you have some basic idea of the tajweed, you can read a book and understand how, what is the al-maddul muttasil, what is al-maddul munfasil, you can differentiate. Okay, you can learn that from a book, but how to say that in the Quran? You have to go and sit uh, in front of a shaykh and learn from that shaykh, and the shaykh teaches you how to pronounce it correctly and how to say it properly. Okay, so that, how Ilm al-Tajweed started. But in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no any theoretical Tajweed or whatever we learn and now, the Ghunna, the Madd, the Sifat al-Huruf, Makharij al-Huruf, Halat uh, al-Basmala, and a lot of stuff that we're gonna see inshallah in this book. None of that was a part of the learning that the Sahaba was getting from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the scholars of Islam after that, they made it. And that's the case with a lot of uh, field of knowledge in Islam, even the Fiqh. Is it the same way that it's taught now? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was he teaching them Al-Wajib, Al-Mustahab, Al-Makruh. Was that a part of his teaching? No. But the scholars of Islam, they followed his teachings and they find out that each thing uh, in the Islamic uh, religion, either to be Wajib or Muharram, Wajib, mandatory, prohibited, Makruh, or to be Mubah, or to be Haram. So they know it and they explain it and what it means. Okay, so that's how Ilm al-Tajweed started. One of the things that we hear a lot in terms of Tajweed, okay, let's say a student is a good in terms of Qira'at uh, al-Qur'an. He is Hafiz, mashallah, he has it in his uh, head. And he is Mutqin, meaning that he is good at it. And people ask a question, does he have Ijazah? Have you ever heard that question? Does he have ijazah? Yes, we hear this a lot, right? So what does the ijazah mean? Does anybody have any idea? An approval. Okay, that's good. An approval from the sheikh or a certificate. Uh, yeah. The chain that came from all the way from Rasulullah till he scholar. That's the, the senate is a senate. part of the ijazah. Uh, sheikh Harun. This senate from the sheikh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. MashaAllah. So MashaAllah, all what you have said is going into the right place, which is given, uh, whatever they said, it gives one portion of the definition of the ijazah. When we say ijazah in Arabic, what does that mean? Ajazah. What does that mean? That, yeah, he permits him or make it permissible for him. Okay, meaning that I'm giving you the permission to sit here. So we understand the meaning of the word ijazah. Okay, ajaz Allahu anakul al-lahm. Allah make it permissible for us to eat the meat. Okay, so that the meaning of the ijazah in, in the Arabic language. Okay, so the Shaykh gives you the ijazah, gives you the permission to teach the Quran. Okay. And that permission is nothing but certification. The Shaykh is saying that your recitation is correct. Your pronunciation is 100% right. 
and you are qualified to teach others. Okay, so that's the meaning of the ijazah. There is a difference between a regular certificate and the ijazah. Can anyone tell me the difference? When we say certificate, usually are certified by an organization, right? A university, for example. Maybe Jam'iyyat uh, Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem, right? Or maybe a masjid, right? Or maybe an institution, right? So that's a certification. And you have the stamp or the signature of that, uh, of that um, entity or that organization. But when we say ijazah, the certification is not coming from an organization. It's coming from an individual, which is the shaykh. We understand that? So when we say Muhammad, mashallah, he has an ijazah in the Quran. What does that mean? That he studied the Quran under a shaykh, and that shaykh gives him the permission to teach the Quran, and the shaykh is certifying his credentials, and he is eligible or qualified to teach the Quran to others. So that's the meaning of the ijazah. Okay, so we understand what the ijazah means. So when the shaykh gives you the ijazah, what you have in the paper of the ijazah, in the beginning, or maybe in the first to three lines, is gonna say, for example, your name is? Umayyad. Abu Ibrahim. Abu Ibrahim, okay. The shaykh will say, Abu Ibrahim came to me and he read the Quran from the beginning to the end. And I found his recitation very uh, good. And I'm a primitive him or I'm giving him the ijazah. I'm certifying him to teach the Quran. Okay, so that's the first portion of the ijazah. That mention in your name. And sometimes it includes your uh, place of birth or maybe your date of birth or whatever, some uh, your uh, basic information. And then the shaykh will say, in this certification, based on the certification that I received from my shaykh. So I'm not giving him the certification because I'm a prophet, no. I'm giving him that certification because I'm certified by my shaykh. My shaykh's name is Khalid, for example. And my shaykh Khalid was certified by his shaykh Hussein. okay? And the shaykh Hussein was certified by shaykh Jibreel. I'm just giving examples and so forth to the Sahaba, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the chain of the Mashaykh in the, that certificate is called a Senate. Okay? So when we say Ijazah, it doesn't mean the Senate. The Senate is the Mashaykh that's between you and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also the Senate, we can hear it in learning a Hadith. When you open uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, حَدَّثَنَا فُلَانَ عَمْ فُلَانَ Meaning that Fulan narrated and he narrated from uh, another person and so forth. So the chain of these narrators, what is it called? A Senate. Okay? The less people we have in the Senate, the more value the Senate has. We understand that? The less people we have, so let's say someone has an ijazah. His Shaykh gave him ijazah, okay? When the Shaykh gave him the ijazah, he mentioned all of his mashayikh all the way to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let's say Muhammad, between him and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, between him and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 13 shaykh. And Hussein, between Hussein and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 15 shaykh. So which senate is more valuable? First one. The first one, because he has less mashayikh between him and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The less people we have in between, so the less mistakes we have, right? Just say one word, I can say it to Jafar. And Jafar say it to uh, Brother Beck. And Brother Beck say it to Khalid. Okay, if we have more people, so after maybe 10 people, the word that I say is gonna change. Okay, so because of that, if we have less people, inshallah is gonna be more authentic. So the Senate, if the Shaykh, that gives you the Ijazah, the Mashaykh between him and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is less, so that Senate has more value. Okay? But that doesn't mean that the shaykh who has less uh, people between him and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his recitation is better. You could have someone who has more people in between him, but he is mujtahid, mashaAllah. And his recitation is more, uh, uh, is, is more beautiful 
in terms of the sound and also at the same time in terms of the tajweed. So it's just a paper. We don't always, um, how to say it, assess people based on that paper. Because even in the, in the life, let's say someone has a bachelor's degree in accounting. That does not mean he's a good accountant. And someone else doesn't have this, the, 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 the bachelor's degree. He just have like a regular certificate, but he's good. He's done a lot of work with a lot of companies. So he has, he is more uh, trained and he has more value in terms of uh, being a good accountant. So because of that, um, not because this person has less people between him and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he's a better qari. No, we always give the person the chance to show us what he has in his head. And always, unfortunately, people just care about the paper. You go anywhere as a speaker, if you have PhD, everybody listens to you. We have a lot of people who have PhD, but they have zero knowledge in their head. Believe me, they have PhD, but they don't have knowledge. A lot. And even throughout your study, if you went to university, you could have a lot of different teachers. Some of them have PhD and some of them don't have it. Those who don't have PhD, they teach better and they know better. And the others that have a PhD, they may not know better. Allahu A'lam. So we always don't, we don't get seduced by the certification. We want to give the chance to the person to prove himself. So anyway, that's how we know if the Senate is more valuable when we have less people in between. Okay, so that's uh, the Ijazah. And as I say, uh, the Ijazah is certification, but the difference between regular or normal certification and the Ijazah is that the certificate usually is by an organization, a school, a masjid, um, institution or whatever. And the Ijazah is given to you by an individual, which is your Shaykh. And the Ijazah is not only in the Quran. The Ijazah also could be in other books. How, for example, Shaykh, uh, Sheikh al Shawkan, he has his book, Fatul al Qadir, Tafsir, in the Tafsir. Okay? So he has a lot of students that study that book under him. He can give them the ijazah, that I'm giving them the permission to teach my book. Because they're good. I trust their knowledge, and they know, mashallah, uh, a lot in terms of what I have in my book, and they know the whole book so they can teach it. So he can give them the ijazah. And then when they have the ijazah, and they teach other students, they can give the ijazah to the other students. So the ijazah is not only in the Quran. The ijazah is also in other books. So you can have ijazah in Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari. Okay? Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam in Makkah al-Mukarramah, one of the scholars that I studied under. So we studied Sahih al-Bukhari. When you finish Sahih al-Bukhari, he gives you ijazah. That you studied Sahih al-Bukhari and he, said, he trusts your knowledge and he gives you the sanad and he studied Sahih al-Bukhari under his shaykh in this way to, to Sheikh al-Imam al-Bukhari. Okay? So the ijazah is not all in the Quran. The ijazah could be in any other book. You understand that point? If anything not clear, we can ask so I can clarify it to you. Okay, so the ijazah is not only in the Quran. The ijazah could be, is in the Quran mainly, and then also we can have in other books. Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari or maybe uh, any book. Okay, let's say kitab or uh, maybe um, any book in the fiqh. So we could have ijazah too in that. Uh, field inshallah. So that's the meaning of the ijazah. And in the ijazah, we can have the senate, the mashayikh between you and the author of that book. So that's the meaning of the senate. The ijazah usually is not something easy. Okay? It's not just you finish the Quran so you can get the ijazah. No. For me, I got the ijazah. Well, how I got it? In the beginning, in Mecca, the way we learn Quran is that you go to your local masjid in the neighborhood and you learn the Quran. At that stage, usually they don't teach you to read well. You just memorize the Quran. Once you finish memorization, you have to go to Ma'had al Arqam ibn Abi al Arqam in San al Masjid al Haram for two years, the Jude and Tafsir. Okay? So in that Ma'had, my Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Barnawi, I finished the Quran from the beginning to the end, and he was not comfortable with my recitation, and I have to repeat it again from the beginning to the end. I did it twice, and then he gave me the ijazah. Because when he gives you the ijazah, it's an amana. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not because um, the person, he just finished the Quran, once I have to give him the ijazah. No, I have to trust his recitation. So he could do it three or four times until I'm comfortable with his recitation. And then I give him the ijazah. It's an amana. It's not a joke. We're not making money or uh, anything like this. This is serious. It's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be very, very honest. And some mashaykh are very, very strict. 
Okay, and the ijazah become easier when you have a previous ijazah. So when you go to a new shaykh, because you can have several ijazat. Okay, so you go to different mashayikh because you learn from, uh, let's say, Sheikh Muhammad. You can go to another shaykh, you can learn something new. You're not going to say, okay, so that's, that's, that's it. I have one ijazah, so that's enough. No, you go to a different shaykh. I went to shaykh, uh, <clears throat> shaykh Ali Sharafi. He gave me the ijazah, but it was quick. Why? Because you already have an ijazah before, so the recitation is going to be very quick because you have the ijazah and your recitation is good. Okay, so this is how it works. You have to have to be someone who has uh, your ijazah is very uh, your recitation is very good, and the sheikh has to trust your ijazah. Then he can give you the, uh, he has to trust your recitation. Then he can give you the ijazah. In some countries, in Mecca, the sheikh will never give you the ijazah except if you do the Quran from the beginning to the end by heart. Bil ghayb. You don't open the mushaf. Okay. In some countries, they give you the ijazah from the book. Uh, we had like a Quran program for the we had like a Quran program for the sisters so some sisters came to be as teachers so I was testing their recitation they said we have ijazah so I was thinking the ijazah because in Mecca when you say ijazah that means someone who has the Quran in his head any surah he can read it. he can read it without opening the mushaf any ayah you can throw any ayah from anywhere in the mushaf he can read it that's someone who's mujaz so they came, I was testing them. I said, okay, read from Surah Al-A'raf. When I asked Habu Nari, I said, ah, we can't do it. We have to open the Mus'haf. I said, so how do we get the ijazah? <laughs> I don't want to mention the name of the country because people may feel offended thinking that Qira'a uh, from that country is not good. So I don't want to mention the name of the country. But anyway, so I said, how come they gave you the ijazah? Because ijazah means you know the Quran. You have it in your head. You can teach it, you can read it at any time. You can go to the member at any time and read. So that's the ijazah, someone who's mujaz. They said, no, they give us the ijazah and hadr. That we read to the teacher, open in the book, and then they give us the ijazah. I said, wow. <laughs> you know, so some places people don't take it that seriously. But it's supposed to be very, very serious. When I give the ijazah to someone, it's someone who is very, very good in their recitation. And he can teach. He can go anywhere and teach. He can go anywhere and people test his recitation. And his recitation, inshallah, will be good. So that's how the ijazah, inshallah, should be always. Now, okay, does anybody have any question about the ijazah, Ikhwani? It's important to know. So, if you, yes. Why do you need multiple ijazahs? Because that's kind of like saying what a not necessarily you have people that have two bachelor's degrees right or they have two certification in the same field you could be an accountant you have a certification from this institution other institution and they could be teaching the same thing you know so it's just that's how the uh, the knowledge of Islam is not only in the Quran, even in the fiqh. Let's say you are studying with Shaykh uh, Muhammad. You don't limit yourself to him. You go to a different Shaykh also you learn. Because definitely you're going to learn something different. Right? Even let's say driving a car. If you have two or three people teaching you, you're going to learn different things from them. Isn't it? So that's the point of going to different mashayikh. And also, uh, in terms of the Qira'ah, when someone has many, many ijazah, that means he is very, very good. Because a lot of mashayikh trusted his recitation, gave him the ijazah, Okay? So that means that person, his recitation is very solid and good. And it's the same as that recitation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the point of the ijazah. Because when the shaykh gives you the ijazah, he's certifying you, saying that your recitation is identical to the recitation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gives you the isnad. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with going to different mashayikh and even the mashayikh themselves, they know that you read under him and you go to a different shaykh and read. So that's not a problem, you have the freedom to do so because no one can limit you to himself. You know, the doors are open and you can learn from anybody. As long as the, the, the person you're learning for, from is someone who is uh, knowledgeable and you can benefit from him, so no problem. Okay, so nothing wrong with that. Any other questions there? Any other questions? Can I ask questions or? 
<laughs> to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, no, it's not necessary for the mufti because the mufti doesn't have to be a qari. We have to differentiate between a qari and a mufti. Okay, Ikhwani? The qari is someone who is knowledgeable in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recitation of the Quran. He knows the tajweed, he knows the recitation, he has the ijazah in that. And he may not know anything in the fiqh. And he may not know anything in the hadith. Okay? And he may not know anything in other field of the knowledge in the Islamic religion. But a mufti, he has to have knowledge in the hadith, knowledge in the fiqh, knowledge in, you know, a tafsir and all of the fields of the Islam because it's going to be given fatwa. So the mufti, and usually the mufti is not a good qari. Usually, go to the Muslim countries, the mufti is not a good qari, is not a good reciter. Okay? So the mufti doesn't have to have uh, the ijazah in the Quran, but he has to memorize or to know the Quran because he's going to be making fatwa and speaking and quoting ayah. If he doesn't have the Quran in his head, is he going to be telling people, wait, let me open the mushaf and look at the ayah and tell you the ayah? No, it's not going to work like this. So you have to have it in your head. And most of the mashayikh, that even if they're not good in the recitation, they still have the Quran in the head, and whenever they teach in you the fiqh, the Islam, they have the ayat in the head, and they can quote the Quran without opening the mushaf. So, a qari is someone who knows uh, the recitation, he knows the tajweed, and he knows how to um, recite the Quran properly with the proper tajweed, and he can teach it. But he is not necessarily that he has to have to be knowledgeable in the fiqh, in the hadith, in the tawheed, in other fields of the knowledge in the Islamic religion. He's supposed to, but he doesn't have to. We cannot say this person is not qari. Why? Because he knows the recitation of the Quran, but he doesn't have any knowledge in the fiqh. He doesn't have to. Okay? He doesn't have to. He is supposed to, but he doesn't have to. And then vice versa. If we have someone who is a mufti, someone who gives a fatwa, he has to learn um, the fiqh and all of the fields of the knowledge of Islam and to be able to be making uh, ahkam and to be given fatwa and answering people's questions. And we have a lot of people that have both. They're good in their recitation and at the same time they are knowledgeable and they didn't know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do both. It's not a problem. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, now we're going to jump to something called al-qira'at. When I say al-qira'at, what's your understanding about the qira'at? Anybody? Yes. From the mahraj, the no, al qiraat. Recitation. Okay. Any other answer? I would say modes of recitation. Huh? Modes of recitation. Uh huh. Any other answers? When I say uh, Sheikh Jafar, I went to his masjid, mashallah, tabarakallah, and he's reciting with a different qira'ah. What does that mean? Uh, qira'ah means. Reading the Quran according to the Tajweed. Yes, the Uh huh. Yes, Zubair. Different form of the Okay. It's the same, but the, the, the way you recite is different. So, Maliki, Maliki. Okay. Maybe, uh, then a Sirata, then a Zirata, then a Sirata. It's a different way of saying the word, right? So it's kind of like a different accent. So what is that? And what's... How many qira'at do we have? Seven. Seven. Good. Ten. 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 Yes. So the authentic qira'at that we can read as worship, we read the Qur'an. And also we can use it in the Salat. We have 10 authentic Qira'at. And then we have four extra that there is a khilaf among the scholars of Islam if they are authentic or not authentic. Okay? But the 10 Qira'at that we have, they are authentic. So we have 10 Qurra, right? And each Qari has how many ra Rawi? Each Qari has how many? Anybody knows? Say nafi'ah. How many? Rawi. Two. Yes. Who said two? Jazakallah khair. So each qari has two ruwat. The recitation that we are reading in most of the Muslim countries is? Hafs. Who is the Shaykh of Hafs? 
Asim. Okay, so Asim is the Qari, and under Asim we have two Ruwa, two narrators, Hafs and Shu'ba. Okay, so saying that, let's go to the beginning. So we have ten Qiraat, right? And each Qari, when we say ten Qiraat, that means we have ten Qurra, right? And each Qari has two Ruwaat. So how many Riwayat we have in total? 20. 20 authentic riwayat that we can read in the salat and we can read as worship for the sake of because reading the Quran is worship. Okay? So we have 20 different riwayat. And these 20 riwayat goes under the 10 qiraat because two ruwaat go under one qari. Clear with that? So, yes. When you say riwayat, is it like authentic hadith that came with it? Is it another, let's say Nafi'a, or let's say Hafs, uh, Asim, okay? So Asim is the Qari. He has his Qira'a different than Nafi'a, different than Ibn Kathir, different than um, Al-Kisai, he's different than Hamza, okay? And then the students that narrated his form of recitation, he has two major ones, Hafs and Shu'ba. So Hafs read a little bit different than Shu'ba, with a slight difference, okay? Slight difference is not that much different, but from Qari to another Qari, big difference. Do you understand this? So Nafi' and Asim, Nafi' is Qari, Asim is Qari, right? So big difference between them, the way they recite is different, okay? And Nafi' has two Ruwad, narrators, Qalun, and Warsh. Okay? they different, but the difference is not the same as the difference between Nafi' and Asim because they are narrated from the same shaykh. Okay? So they slightly differ. We got that? So each... Yes? I didn't get it. You didn't get it. Okay. I'll explain it again. I'll, 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 I'll give you an example with the people that we have in here. So let's say we have 10 Qurra, right? Abu Ibrahim is Qarib. Shaykh Harun is Qari, Ja'far is Qari, right? And then what's your name? Abdullah, Abdullah is Qari. So these are Qurra, we just take four. In each Qari, has how, how many or what? Two. Has two. I mean, does he have to have two or he can have more? He has more, but the, 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 uh, the famous ones and the ones that are in the books, in the scholars of Tajweed, um, certified and accepted as authentic recitation are two. We have many, many students, but they, what we have in the books, just two. Okay? So, Shaykh Abu Ibrahim, he has two narrators, Khalid and Beck. Right? So, Abu Ibrahim is going to be way different than Shaykh Harun. Because they two different Qurra. But Khalid and Beck, they're going to be closer. Why? Because they, they go under one Shaykh. Okay? So, these are the heads. And from the heads, we have two other heads coming. We understand that? So Hafs and, uh, Hafs and, and Shu'ba, they narrated from Asim. So they're going to be very similar. Okay? They will differ, but slightly, not that, that much. And then we have Ibn Kathir. He is Qarim. And under Ibn Kathir, we have al Bazi and Qumbul. Okay? They are different, but slight, the, the difference is very, very small. It's not that big difference. We understand? So that's how many qiraat we have. We have 10 qurra, and then under each qari we have how many ruwat? We have two ruwat. Okay? So the total of the riwayat, the authentic riwayat is 20. And then we have other additional four qiraat that we have khilaf among the scholars, whether they're authentic or not authentic. And how do they uh, give the hukum, the judgment to the qira'ah that is authentic based on three criteria. Number one, sahatu sanan. That this recitation, the chain between that recite, that, that qari and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi has to be authentic. Mashayikh that are hafidhi mutqineen, they are good in tajweed. And then muafaqatuha liwajh min awjih al al arabiya. And then the recitation has to be upon the Arabic language. So if someone come with a qira'ah in a different language, immediately that's not Qur'an. Okay? That's not Qur'an, immediately. 
So we don't have any Quran in a different language. We have one Quran, Quran in Arabic, in Arabic. So if it's in a different language or it's claimed to be Arabic, but it's different from the rules of the Lugha Al-Arabiya. We have rules for the, each Lugha has rules. So we have recitation that goes off in terms of following the rules of Al-Arabiya. So that recitation is not authentic. Okay? And then also the recitation has to match Al-Rasm Al-Uthmani. When Uthman radiallahu anhu wrote the Mus'haf, so the recitation has to match whatever is in Mus'haf or Uthman. So if we have additional words, or words are taken off from that recitation, and it doesn't match Mus'haf or Uthman, so that recitation is what? Shadda. Okay? That recitation is Shadda. When we say Shadda, we cannot read it as worship. We can use it for the tafsir. And we go in deeper a little bit. I don't want to confuse you too much. So the Qira'at to Shadda, we can use it for the tafsir, for the meaning of the Quran, but we cannot use it in the Salat. Okay? So we have 10 authentic Qurra, and under each Qad it goes to uh, go to uh, narrator. So in total we have 20 authentic riwayat. We understand that. Okay. Yes. All of them are authentic and I'm going to talk about that. All of them. And I'm going to talk about that inshallah in details. I'm coming to that. Yes. I'm going to talk about that inshallah. Uh, good question, but I'm going to talk about it. So the question that he's at, yes. How do you verify the authenticity of the Ijazah or Sanat? Uh, that's a good question because we have a lot of fake Ijazah. You know, you could have someone claiming that he has Ijazah, but he does, he's, he, his Ijazah is not authentic. But what people usually do, because if it's in Mecca, let's say in Mecca, people know each other. So if you say, I took a jazz of Mushra Abdul Rahman Barnawi, all of his students, you know, know each other. So they will know. But if you go to a different country or a different place, you could lie. Allah Mustaan. And people do that, fortunately. But anyway, someone who's uh, mujaz from his recitation, when he leads the salat, when he's teaching, you will know that this person is, is his recitation is good. You know, but still, there's, and also even some mashayikh. Some of them, they're not strict in terms of the ijazah. So they could have a very weak student and they still give them the ijazah. Okay, so anyway, uh, you have to make sure the person who's taking your knowledge from is someone who is, you know, uh, has a proper ijazah and has a, uh, he received a proper education from the scholars and he is certified in mujazah to give you the ijazah. And sometimes also you can do uh, like when I get my ijazah from Sheikh Abdul Rahman Barnawi, it has only his name and his signature. What I did is I went to Jamiyatul Quran in Mecca Al Mukarramah, which is the organization that takes care of memorizing the Quran and they stamp it. So this is when you go somewhere and they see the stamp of the Jamiyah, they will know this is authentic. So some people do that. And sometimes the Sheikh could partner with a school. The Sheikh could partner with a school, a recognized school. So he teaches you in that school, he gives you the ijazah, and the ijazah has his signature and the stamp of that organization or whatever school he is, part, uh, he is a partner with, okay? But anyway, the person who has a good ijazah, usually uh, when he recites, you're gonna uh, notice that and you're gonna understand that that person is truly knowledgeable and that person is uh, mujaz, okay? So now these qiraat, we say different forms. How do they differ? When we say different, do they give different meaning? As Brother Jafar asked, no, they don't give different meaning. Either they give the same meaning or they give an extra meaning. So they give you more explanation on the ayah. That's one form of difference in the Qur'an. And sometimes it could be just a difference in the lahja, in the accent. An example, when you say, uh, okay, another recitation, Ibn Am, it's the same word, but the, the way it's pronounced is different, and that based on the different accents of the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula. So, the Prophet, when he was teaching people the Quran, he was teaching them according to what's close to their tongue. Because some people in the Arabian Peninsula they say, and some say, you know. 
So the Prophet was not forcing them to read according to a different accent that's hard on them. And that in every language in the whole world. When you go to different uh, countries, when you go to the northern part of the country, they speak different. You go to the southern part, they speak differently. They don't speak the same accent, it's the same language. They understand each other, but they speak differently. It's the same word, they pronounce it differently. Okay? So, you have a lot of differences just in that lahja, in that accent. The imala, an example. And also some differences in the mad. Like uh, Hafs, he does five harakat in al maddul muttasil And uh, Hamza does sitta harakat, six harakat, longer. And Ibn Kathir does shorter, three harakat. So the difference didn't change the, the meaning. And also the way you pronounce the word, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, it's the same name, but same, different pronunciation. It doesn't change the, um, uh, it doesn't change the meaning. And uh, when I think in 2015 or maybe in 2016, I read with a different citation and I was saying Ibrahim, a lot of people got mad saying that the Imam is reading with the Qira'atul Yahud, the Jewish Qira'ah. But Jews don't have Quran. <laughs> because that's how Jewish people say Ibrahim, say Ibrahim. So it's one of the accents of the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula in the Quran came, you know, with that form. And it's an authentic Quran. So whether the Jews saying it this way or they don't, we don't care. It's authentic. It's in the, uh, uh, we have Isnad in that recitation. is according to what Uthman radiallahu anhu wrote in the book. And it's according to the Arabic language. So it's an authentic Quran. Because some people, they have, you know, they don't have the knowledge of the Qur'an. They don't know what is Qur'an. They think the Qur'an is just Hafs. And even the Masahib, we have Warsh in here, in the Masjid. And sometimes people come to me and say, uh, we have a different Mus'haf. Maybe this is some Jewish people, they come in the Masjid and put it. It's not, it's not a good Mus'haf. I said, no, it's a different recitation. And they don't understand what does that mean. Because all of their lives, they just seen uh, Mus'haf Hafs. You know, so when they see different Qira'a uh, or Riwayah, they doubt. Maybe someone who's not Muslim just sneaking in the masjid and put the Qur'an in. <laughs> so it's important to know what is Qira'at and the difference. So it's, it doesn't change the meaning. You know, as a scholar says, اختلاف التنوع. That is different, but it gives different types. It's, it doesn't contradict itself. Because when you have difference, and the two differences can, can contradict in themselves, so that's something wrong. We will never have such thing in the Quran. Okay, so the difference is not like that. It's just in the accent, the way the word sometimes is singular, sometimes it's plural, ayah, ayat, but it gives the same meaning. It's not different. Okay, so now the most important question, do we have to learn all of these qira'at? Do we have to? We don't have to. One qira'at is enough. Okay, one qira'at is enough. But we still must have some people in the ummah that has to go uh, or the, uh, they have to take care of that field of knowledge because if, they, if we're not taking care of it, it's going to disappear. So alhamdulillah, we have that in universities, in uh, uh, local schools, local masajid, alhamdulillah, al qiraat is there. And we have a lot of people dedicated for that knowledge and they learn it. But as, as, as a Muslim, do you have to learn it? You don't have to. You just have to learn one authentic recitation, whether it's Hafs, Warsh, Qalun, uh, Adduri, Khalaf, Khalad, it doesn't matter. So you just have to learn one. And it's better to learn whatever people read in your country. And we're gonna talk about Hafs. And why Hafs is more popular in the Muslim world. Anywhere you go in the Muslim countries, people uh, read Hafs. Why? We're gonna talk about that inshallah shortly. Okay? So you can learn any Qira'ah and all of them are the same. Meaning that no Qira'ah is less than the other. So not because majority of Muslim read Hafs. So if you have someone reading in Qira'at Ibn Dakwan, who will say you're reading something that's less, and you're going to get less reward, and that recitation is less authentic. No, they are all authentic and they are the same. No any difference, eh, ikhwani. Okay, so no discrimination in the Qira'at. So now because someone is not reading our recitation, Hafs, who will say his recitation is not correct. No, all of them are the same. Okay, like in Morocco, majority of people learn Warsh. So if we have an imam from Morocco and he's reading Warsh, we're not going to tell him, no, you, you have to read Hafs. He doesn't have to. Both are authentic. And we should be uh, reading different qira'at so people can have knowledge of it. 
and they know what are the qiraat. So we don't run into a situation when someone hears a different qiraat will be arguing with the Imam why you read in this and why you read in, in a different form. Okay? So all of the qiraat are the same. The question is why Hafs is more popular in the Muslim world? Anywhere you go, people read Hafs. Okay? You go to uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, e, um, a lot of part of Egypt, you go to Asia, you go to Africa. Back in days, people were, were reading Warsh more in Africa, but now Hafs is taken over in Africa. And also you go to the Western world, US, Europe, people read Hafs. What is the reason? Aren't we, we have other 19 recitations, but we only have one riwayah, which is the riwayah of Hafs. It's popular everywhere. You go, people read Hafs. Yes. Is it because of the rules of the Khalifa? To, you know? It's not the rule. It's, you close, but it's not quite that. What happened is that um, in Al Kufa, Al Kufa used to be the capital of Muslims. The Khalifa is in Al Kufa. Okay, so when you have a capital, it's a city with a lot of people. And you're gonna have a lot of scholars, you're gonna have a lot of job opportunities, and you're gonna have a lot of people from different places coming to that place for living and also for knowledge. So Asim was in Al Kufa. Okay, and you have other three other Qurra also from the Kufa, Hamza and Al Kisai. Okay, so how many Qurra we have in Al Kufa? We have three Asim, Hamza, and Al Kisai. Asim he has two ruwat. Hafs and Shu'bah. Okay, so why Shu'bah is not popular and Hafs is more popular? Because Hafs was teaching in Al Kufa and then the, the capital of Muslims changed from Al Kufa to Baghdad. The Khalifa moved to Baghdad and Hafs moved to Baghdad. So people learned from him in Al Kufa when it was the capital and then also people learned from him in Baghdad when it became the capital and also he went to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah which is the center of Muslim the scholars of Islam they go there they meet in the Hajj for conference for Masail for a lot of dialogue and a lot of uh, Mu'tamarat and a lot of uh, Halaqat in Al-Masjid Al-Haram so he went to Mecca and he taught in Mecca and many people go to the Hajj and they learn from him and when they learn from him they go to their country when they go to their country they teach that recitation so this way Ruwaya to Hafs became more popular. This is one of the reasons. And also Hafs, he was dedicating all of his time for the, for the, for the teaching. So in Al-Kufa, he was teaching. Anytime you go to Hafs, you're gonna find him to, available to teach you. In the other Ruwa, they're not the same. And also Hafs was the stepson of Asim. So he was in the same house with Asim and he learned more from Asim than Shu'bah. So Hafs and Shu'bah, they narrated from Asim. But Hafs was a stepson for uh, Hafs was a stepson for Asim and he was with him in the same household and he learned more from him. So because of that, Hafs is more mutqi. Even a Shatabi said of Itqani kana mufaddala. That Hafs was more preferable because of his itqan. He was very good in the recitation. It was Dabil. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. Reason number two it's easier it's very easy so people when they go to the Kufa they go to Sheikh Hamza his Qira'ah is very long you have to have long breath and now everybody has that and then also he has Sakatat he has a lot of different rules which is hard for people to learn but Hafs is easy and same thing with Al-Kisai he has a lot of Imalat so people when they go to the Kufa they just learn Qira'ah to Asim and they go to Hafs more because Hafs is more available so more people are learning from Hafs. When they learn from him, they're gonna go back to their places and they're gonna spread his recitation. Okay, so this way Hafs became more popular. Number two also, or number three, the Rasmul Quran. When we have the, um, uh, the, the matabi in the modern world, when we have the, um, the, the copy machines that make in the Quran, they made it in Hafs and they distributed in different places of the world. So this made it also to become more popular. And also like in Africa, the reason why, because I remember when I was a kid, majority of people from Africa, they read Warsh, but now the opposite, they read Hafs. 
And the reason why is because they go to Saudi Arabia for Al Jamia Al Islamiyah and Al Jamia Umm Al Qur'an, they learn Hafs. And when they go back, they teach Hafs. So this way, Hafs took over and spread. So people read Hafs more. But still, in a lot of uh, African countries, people uh, read in Wash. Okay? So uh, this way, the, the, the Masahif was written in Hafs and it was distributed in different countries uh, of Muslims. And this way, the Qira'a spread more and people are reading Riwayat uh, to Hafs more than other riwayat uh, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, read the Quran with. Okay? And most importantly, there is no any difference between Hafs and Shu'bah, Bazzi, Qumbul, any other recitation, any other authentic recitation, they're all the same. We can learn any one of them and we can uh, say this recitation is better than the other recitation because they're all authentic and they're all connected to the Quran. The scholars of Islam, they did their best to make sure all of these Qiraat are authentic and we have the Isnad from the Mashayikh to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in each riwayah. So all of them are authentic and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, read with these uh, different riwayat and different recitations. Any questions? Yes. If the Qur'an, they are reciting the Holy Quran with different Qari and the one who harp give different meanings like, like Maliki Yawmiddi mm -hmm. Maliki Yawmiddi Malik and Malik it's got different meaning. It's, it's, it's different meaning, but at the same time, they mean the same thing. Uh, Malik is the owner, uh, the owner of the hereafter. Malik is the king of the hereafter. It's the same meaning. Okay? So the word itself is different, but at the same time, both different words, they giving you the same um, concept meaning that Allah dominate the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the control over the hereafter okay he is the king of the hereafter and he is the owner of the of the hereafter both words come from in the same point so such khilaf or such difference is not a difference that contradicting the other meaning so that's not a problem okay so both meaning they just come from the same point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls and dominate um, the hereafter and whatever happens in there is under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one can do anything that's out of the will and the irad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the difference, but in reality, they mean the same thing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's do a quick review. So in Mutajweed, we have two types of Ilm Al-Tajweed, or Ilm Al-Tajweed goes into two categories. Category number one, Periodic. the theoretical Tajweed that you learn through the books, and you learn the Ghunna, the Mad, and everything. And the, the second one, Application. the applied or the practical Tajweed that you learn from the Shaykh. And in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what type of Tajweed? Application. Yeah, the applied one or the practical one. Uh, ijaza. when we say Ijaza, what is the difference between the Ijaza? and a normal certification. What is the difference? From a shaykh, from an individual. And what is a senad? The chain, the chain of the, uh, the, 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 the the chain of men, that between you and between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the isnad. So, okay, uh, true or false, the more mashayikh we have, the more valuable the Isnad come. False. So the more Mashayikh we have, the less valuable the Isnad becomes. Okay? The less Mashayikh we have, the more valuable the Isnad becomes. Okay? Uh, what is Qira'a? How many Qira'at do we have? How many authentic Qira'at we have? Ten. Ten. And each Qari, how many Rawi has? He has? Two. Two. So in total, how many Riwayat we have? Twenty. And when we, um, uh, uh, which qira'a, or true or false, hafs is the best recitation? True, false. False, false. All of them are the same, ikhwani. No discrimination, okay? <laughs> All of them are the same. But easy though. 
it, yeah, we can say the easiest. We can say the easiest. And it becomes the easiest because, because it's the popular. Because still, people from Morocco, Warsh is easier for them. Because they grew up, you know, learning Warsh. So house is difficult for them. And we have brother Abu Ayyub. Yeah, he was... You know, it's easier for him to read Warsh. Yeah, One time he was reciting, somebody was next to me, and he said, Ayah Sibu. He said, Ayah Sabu. And the brother said, brother says, he was next to me, he said, Ayah Sabu. In the salat? Yeah, he said, he says, like, he didn't hear, the chef didn't hear him. And I'm saying to myself, you don't know. He didn't know. They were reciting Warsh. And I didn't tell him. I just didn't say anything. Because he didn't say it loud enough. I could only hear him. Yeah, it so funny, you know? uh, it is easier because it's more popular. But in reality, is e when we say easier, it doesn't have imalat, it doesn't have very long mud, it doesn't have sakatat, because like qira'at hamza, when you, there's a lot of sakatat, a lot of things to keep track of. Even the qurra, those who know the qira'at, qira'at hamza is not that easy, you have to prepare. And you have to keep track of a lot of things in different awujo. If you do this, so then you have to do that. We don't have that in Hafs. So that in reality makes it easier. And becoming more popular make it more easier. But it's the same. It's not the best and the most authentic recitation. Okay? Uh, okay, the difference in the qira'at is that some qira'at in are true or false. The difference between the qira'at is that some qira'at are in different languages. False. All qira'at are in one language, which is Arabic. But they're in different Excellent. dialects or accents or form of speaking. Okay, and also we can have a difference in the, uh, in the how to say, the, 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 the word, the way you say the word or the way, uh, the, 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 the meaning of the word, like Malik and Malik. It's not a different accent, it's a different word, but they mean the same thing at the end. Okay, and all of these khilafat does not change, um, the meaning of the Quran does not change the point of the Quran. The Quran is one and the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from one source. And the Quran is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing will change. The Quran, even if we have different recitation, they still uh, <coughs> contribute to the same fact and to the same, uh, to the same thing, which is, it's the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's the hujjah. It is the burhan, it's the miracle of uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him with. So that's enough for today, inshallah. I hope these three things, we master them. If we have any question from anyone, we can explain inshallah um, to them. And then inshallah, next week, Monday, we're gonna talk about more topics in the Tajweed. And we're gonna go to the book, inshallah. Al-Burhan fi Tajweed al-Quran. We're gonna know the value, makana to ilm al-Tajweed. The importance of the ilm al-Tajweed. And then also we're gonna, um, understand some very important points before also learning the tajweed like uh, who made al-mutajweed who first started al-mutajweed uh the 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 the, the value or the importance of that of the the, the al-mutajweed and adam said that's very important and essential before going into the Tajweed and learning the Messiah of the Tajweed, inshallah. So any other questions before we conclude and finish the lecture, inshallah? Yes. What's on Wednesday? On Wednesday, inshallah, Tafsir. Because I was thinking of doing Tajweed and Tafsir and their recitation, the time is so short, we're not gonna be able to do all of that. So on Monday, we will do Tajweed. And then if we have time, we're gonna do some recitation and then we do Tafsir. And then um, if we find ourselves that we very, uh, we're not given the tilawa, uh, you know, we don't have time for the tilawa. So maybe one of the weeks we can cancel the lecture and do the tilawa for the whole time. Okay? So inshallah, that's what we're going to be doing. Monday, tajweed. And then on Wednesday, we're going to do the tafsir. We started the tafsir last week, Surah Al-Fatiha. And we're going to continue that inshallah Wednesday, the day after, tomorrow inshallah. So jazakumullah khayran wa baraka fikum. Salli Allahumma wa sallim. على نبينا محمد